Well, turn with me now into chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, and we're moving through verses 1 to 5 this morning. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it best to be left behind alone at Athens. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you for the benefit of your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this, for even when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. So, and so it happened, as you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would be for nothing. I want to suggest that this passion passage begins with a uh, clarion reminder of the importance in the Bible of what we might call incarnational living, incarnational ministry. We mentioned this the first day. We mean by that that we take seriously how Jesus came to us in the flesh what we call incarnation, God himself becoming human. And so we minister likewise to others, not in written words alone or in other forms of distant learning or distant relationships, but in real flesh and body presence. And the urgency of this is expressed by the Apostle Paul in verse 1, as you can read it there, where he says that they could no longer endure it. They could no longer endure what? Well, of course, he means the lack of incarnational presence or doing ministry by being with them physically, not a distant learning situation, but face to face. And so, because for some reason Paul and the others of his team could not go, maybe a legal problem, perhaps a health problem, some suggest, they send Timothy, as we read so clearly in verses 1 and 2, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it be best to be left behind alone at Athens, and we sent Timothy, our brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you for the benefit of your faith. So as good students of the Bible, we should ask, why? Why Timothy? Why not someone else of his team? And verse 2, all by itself, gives a long list to answer that question, why Timothy. First, the Bible refers to him here as, you see there, our brother. So as to indicate that this Timothy is fully part of the family of God. The brother-sister terminology, of course, is familial, family-based. Not just a brother or even the brother, but our brother, so as to emphasize that he is part of the local family of God, the local church, which Paul knew well, and so a simple reminder of the depth of their personal ties. This morning, I want to call forth you as young women and young men, call forth Timothy's. And in my understanding, biblical theology, this would include women in leadership whom we might refer to for the sake of a better name, Timothy S's. So to the Timothy S's and the Timothys, I want to call forth young leaders like Timothy, both men and women, who are fully committed to the local family, the local church. That is, in the incarnational intimacy of a local congregation. I stress this, sisters and brothers, 
I do not believe you can be a fully functioning Christian outside of involvement in a local body, a local church, the body of Christ. When, when disgruntled Christians say to me, oh, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, but I just don't go to church, I just can't stand church, there's something wrong with that, biblically, theologically. Please be involved in the local church. It needs your Timothy-like presence. Second, this dear young man, Timothy, is described here in the most significant and actually quite a powerful way as God's fellow worker. Do you see it there in verse 2? We sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker. It's dependent upon a hugely important word that Paul uses from time to time throughout his letters to describe people who serve God well. Sunergon is the Greek term, which actually describes being someone who is in partnership with God. In orchestral situations, you learn about partnership, at least stand to stand, sitting at a stand together, at least in strings and so forth, where there's multiple instruments on one, one line, one part. You have to partner. But think of this invitation to actually partner with God, God's fellow worker. And I want to call forth Timothy S's, Timothy's. Today, I want to ask for people who happily take up the challenge of working side by side with God. People who say, I will partner with God whatever that requires of me. And then this verse goes on to say, verse 2, that such work is in the interest of the very good news, that is the gospel itself, God's fellow workers in the gospel of Christ. To call forth Timothy's and Timothy S's. And so we're looking for people who understand or are committed to the importance of the gospel to be good news people, as we talked about yesterday, people who fully, totally affirm that the good news of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can truly bring transformation, which actually changes the world because it can change the human heart. To be committed to the centrality of the gospel of Christ. The good news that Jesus changes everything. Timothy's goal, as we see further in verse 2, was to strengthen others. Timothy's goal, as we see even further in verse 2, was also to encourage others. We sent Timothy, our brother, God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you. I want to call forth Timothy S's, Timothy's today. People who so care about others around them that their focus is on how can I bring strength to your life? How can I bring encouragement to you? In Chehi, that happens in many different forms, different relationships, but I want to highlight where I think the, the rub comes most, and that is like the counseling staff at this institution bring to you. These counselors who pour into you, who spend time with you, or with you all through the day and night because they're there to strengthen and encourage you, not about themselves. I laud them. I was a counselor at Chehi for quite a few years, and it's not easy. It's hard work. Now, I know the faculty and the other staff all do the same, but in different ways, but they say good night and go home to their little room. That's what I do. Escape. The counselors, boy, they're with you. 
bless them. Maybe reverse this. How can you strengthen them? How can you encourage them even today? And then it concludes with such a beautiful, meaningful, revealing statement of selflessness that marked this young man, Timothy. Verse 2 <coughs> ends so poignantly. We sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you for the benefit of your faith. Isn't that amazing? Don't skip over that. It's perfunctory. That so bespeaks Timothy's heart and character, where so many would be so utterly consumed by what does Christian faith in general what does my own growth in faith in particular do for me? How does it help me? How does it solve my dilemmas? How does faith development give me an advantage in life and in death? Timothy, dear, dear young Timothy, is all about how he could serve others for the benefit of your, your faith. I want to call forth Timothys and Timothy S's today. So I'm calling forth people who are so selfless as to be utterly concerned about what is for the benefit of the faith of others. Not self-centered people, but selfless. Martin Luther, you might know, defined sin as the human being curved in on himself or herself. This is the opposite. This is outreaching, selflessness, not curved in on yourself. Again, I see this so exemplified in the counseling staff here, selflessness. In fact, I just want to take a moment because brother, dear brother Andrew Harry gave me a few extra minutes. So just to pray for the counselors. Lord God, thank you so much for the counseling staff that work with the Chamber Fest students, for Sean and Abby and for Addie and anybody else I forget, and then the whole Miles. Miles, who gave me his student card so I can go to the workroom. Thank you so much. Thank you for these dear counselors and for all the counselors working with the middle school. Bless them. Thank you that they serve for the benefit of the faith of others and encourage them today in the name of Jesus, amen. We move on, though. This focus on Timothy then pushes us to the necessary question again. One of the best questions in biblical study is always why? 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 Why do we need strength and encouragement as concerns our faith at all? And the short answer in the final verses of this passage is that we are, of course, dealing with the real world, not a make-believe world, not a bubble world, but a real world. And one of the realities of the real world, is, real, real world is that we are invariably encountering and confronting what the Apostle Paul here references as afflictions, things that are hard, things that cause you perplexity, things that cause despair, even levels of suffering that are so common in the real world. And things that are not so common, like a demonically inspired war that is happening right now. I have the great blessing of teaching three times a year for intense, called intensive weeks in a master's program at the Ukraine Evangelical Theological Seminary in Kiev. I was there last 
spring at the outset of the war. I was there in October, 10 days at a time, and I was just there in April. These are some friends of mine there, Natalie and Carrillo. Carrillo was a student. He is now, he just finished the master's program that I lead in Bible and mission. And he's doing a PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. That's his wife and they have two children and she's in that picture, she was about two months pregnant, and she will be having a third baby. And the stress of living in a war zone. While I was there this past time in April, in the course of 10 days, there were three drone attacks of 15, 16 drones, all, most of which are shot out of the sky by the Ukrainian army. But I, every time there was at least one that, that hit ground and massive explosion. You could feel it in the ground and see the light, usually in the middle of the night. Everybody has your stuff ready to run to the basement or some bomb shelter. This is their world. And I was so honored to be part of the teaching for me was so outweighed by learning from them, the faithful people, Christians who have a vision for what God is going to do after this war. They're so confident. Faith in Jesus that carries them through. This is a demonically inspired war in which Putin and his minions are clearly talk, taking directions from the death and destruction agenda of hell itself by which Satan is directing. It is such a real lived experience for all people, especially people of faith trying to make sense of things in the midst of a generally fickle and faithless and so much an unjust world. Paul here mentions it twice, doesn't he? In verse 3, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. And second, right away again, even in verse 4, even when we were with you, we kept telling you advance that we were going to suffer affliction. I don't know how you feel about that. with the Mideastern Muslim background refugees that I work with that are flooding into Europe from Iran and Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, all Muslim, speak, uh, Muslim backgrounds, they come to a place of freedom and they're meeting Jesus powerfully as I mentioned, when I get back, the very week after I get back, we have the joy of baptism of 18 of these men and women. But they come to faith in Christ, and then they think everything's going to be great. It's all going to be wonderful. No more problems. And yet, they soon discover there are afflictions. Theirs may be much more severe than you or I ever face. But your afflictions are real. What are the things that cause you distress, those things that cause you to question, those things that bring perplexity? What does it mean to follow Jesus in this world? Apostle Paul here says we must be strengthened and encouraged in faith because we live in the real world where there is affliction until Jesus comes again. We're going to look at that on our last day on Friday. One of the major themes of 1 Thessalonians is this grand truth of biblical faith, Christ comes the second time. 
in power and in glory to, to make right all that has been wrong. Because now there are afflictions. But according to this text, dear young Timothys and Timotheuses, there is another reason. Another reason that strength and encouragement for faith is needed. And that is that the Bible does not hesitate to teach us that there is, there is an enemy of your soul. And here he is called the tempter. Do you read that with me in verse 5? For this reason, this reason is why you need strength. This is the reason you need a Timothy to come along and encourage you, a Timothy S. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I also sent to find out about your faith for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be for nothing. Dear young women, young men, staff, faculty, all of us, myself, strength and encouragement are demanded because we live in the real world where afflictions can easily cause you to unhealthily question. There is a healthy questioning and then there is an unhealthy questioning where Satan's tempting agenda is constantly trying to tempt you to disobey, to fall short, to give up on the demands of faith and abandon the path of faith. The tempter, Satan, is the real enemy. Whether in seemingly innocuous temptations of selfishness or pride or in how satanic forces are blatantly and clearly and obviously using Putin and his minions as his pawns in a hideous war that means life or death for my friends in Ukraine. I have two master's degree students, young men who are now dead as they went to the east 26, 27 years old. And because of this unjust war, they've lost their lives. They were happy to stand up and join their brethren and sisters to defend their right to be a country. Behind it, it's not just Russian hegemony, power, dominion. Behind it is a real force that the Bible takes seriously, the enemy of your soul. His name is the tempter, the accuser, the devil, or Satan. This is the real world. Do not let him deceive you and tempt you away from your faith in God that will in the end assure you of triumph, whether big or small, in the interest of Christ and his kingdom. And so this morning, in our third morning together, midway through this Thessalonian 1 letter, I am unapologetically, unabashedly, blatantly calling forth for Timothy S's, Timothy's for this day, this world. Whether you're a young woman or a young man, will you become a Timothy in the world around you to be incarnationally present with those who suffer, 
to be a brother or sister representing the family of God, to be involved in your local body of Christ, your church. To be one who actually has a vision of partnering with God, to be God's fellow worker, whatever that asks of you. To partner specifically in the glorious work of the good news, the gospel of Christ. To both strengthen and encourage people who are weak and discouraged. To live your life on behalf of, for the benefit of the faith development, not just of yourself, but of others. To be living response to the afflictions that so mar God's beautiful world, his creation, which is so marred by the result of sin and to say no to the tempter. A huge part of living exemplary Christian lives is the guts to say no, to say no to the tempter. In whatever way he comes, no who has turned Putin into a pawn of hell and will find ways to make war on your very soul and draw you into areas of disobedience. Say no. I want to call forth Timothy's and Timothy S's today. If God The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, calling you out right now in this moment to be such a Timothy, such a Timothy S. Will you say no to the tempter and yes to the Spirit? Yes, Lord. So I want us just to close in a minute of silent prayer, and if that's the sense you have, the Spirit is calling you to be Timothy, to be a Timothy S. How will you respond? Will you say, yes, Lord? So just one minute of silent prayer, and then we'll conclude. As we conclude in prayer, I'm just going to put the photo back on the screen of Carrillo and Natalie and ask you to look at that and pray for them. When I went to Ukraine this last time in April, huge long train journey that took about 12 hours from Poland into Kyiv, there were thousands of people, mainly women and children and young university students, coming back to say, no, we will not be forced out of our country. Coming back amidst all sorts of dangers, especially women with young children, and all of the, all of the stress of every few days, a drone attack, and what will happen to their children, to themselves. Jesus, Strengthen Carrillo, strengthen Natalie right now. I pray for the birth of Natalie, hope and strength. Keep her from depression that attacks her when she's fearful. Remind her that she can trust you. I pray for these Timothys and Timothy S's here today, that you would call forth people like Timothy to represent you incarnationally in our world.
Thank you for Chehi and how it strengthens and encourages musical advancement, but also spiritual growth for the gospel of Christ, for Christ and his kingdom. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In another situation, I might have invited you to raise a hand or come forth. but I just felt it was better to have prayer. But if you want to follow up on this call to be a Timothy or Timothy S, seek out a counselor. Go to them. Say, help me. What does that mean for my life? Or if you want to talk to me, I'm so available. Bless you. Have a great day as you work hard. Amen.